Hey, welcome to this week's edition of 26 Minutes with uh, the show that honors those who are leading, making an impact and creating positive change on the planet and of course locally. I'm your host, David Cohen, and I'm really pleased to have uh, this week's guest with us, Chris Saunders. He's he's a pro GM rapper, co-host of the Nerdpreneur podcast. Uh, he's a coach. He does work with uh, Jeff Walker uh, from uh, the famous for the book Launch. And, and shows you how to launch your, um, you know, your, your content um, online. And um, I really recommend uh, you tapping into uh, the book Launch by Jeff Walker and, and his work. And somewhere along the line, if you study with uh, Jeff, you might meet Chris, which I had the pleasure of about a month ago. And we, we got to talking and he told me about this podcast that he does called nerdpreneur and i went oh that's interesting so this week we're going to lighten it up we've been doing some heavy duty topics chris the past two weeks around leadership and youth justice and and we we got we got to lighten things up so um (laughs) now a nerdpreneur they have fun conversations with people who turn their weird passion into successful businesses they interview entrepreneurs from around the world to discover the hacks the tools the mindsets that turn nerd passion into full-time income. They've interviewed dozens of niche professionals from all over the world, including board game designers, dice retailers, D&D content creators, Dungeons and Dragons, tarantula breeders, and even a German zombie magician. I was going to say musician, though. Uh interesting like your vibe man uh that'll be next season (laughs) yeah (laughs) don't don't put it past anybody so if you want to listen to chris uh and frank his co-host talk nerdy about gen z and millennial entrepreneurship current trends affecting the nerd markets and why three cats is too many cats um then you want to tap into nerdpreneur so welcome chris good to see you man Thanks, David. I'm super excited to be here today on 26 Minutes With, and uh, I appreciate that you wanted to have me on, and I'm excited about what we're going to dive into today. Uh, Yeah, Nerdpreneur has been my passion project for the last uh, year and a half, maybe, maybe a little bit less than that, but, you know, I don't know where where do we go from here? Do you want me to start talking about that or how it got got started? I've got questions ready for you. Perfect, perfect. How did, so you said a year and a half ago, how did it come together? What what was the, you know, the genesis of it, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Well, let me, let me get into that. The, 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 uh, you know, if you go back a few years, we all had kind of a collective human experience called the COVID pandemic, right? And, you know, there was lots of challenges and lots of things uh, that that were were kind of rough for people across the entire globe, right? We all had this collective experience. Now, the thing I noticed is that how you react to those types of situations really determines someone's uh, you know, le- quality of life and and success. And I think when I was going through that uh, situation, I was on Instagram and I was a bit on TikTok and I saw that there was this group of people that were reacting in a really different way than I think what say news media was per- portraying or what a lot of people were portraying. And they were actually you know, because their jobs were shut down or because they worked in restaurants and now nobody can go to a restaurant, they started to have no other option but to put out content and see if they could actually do something with their nerdy passion. And I can't tell you how many people I saw that had this almost like positive, I'd say, reaction to being forced to kind of be home. And they started to attract people online by putting out content that was really interesting. And then I started to see all these people who who said to them, who said, maybe I can make money at this. And it was a range of different niches. You know, like I said, we've inter- interviewed people. I started mainly in the Dungeons and Dragons niche because that's where I was building my own sort of content and I was building my own little business. And I had put out a podcast in that niche a few months ago or a few years ago before that. Um, and so I noticed that there were all these Dungeons and Dragons creators that were attracting like tens of thousands of people to their to their Instagrams or to their TikToks. And then many of them were starting to produce content. And they were, uh, and by that, I mean like stuff that you could actually pay for, either gated content or you could support them 
I'm on Patreon. Um, there was a guy who was doing like music for your Dungeons and Dragons campaign. And then I started thinking about it. Well, well, these are like entrepreneurs, but they're not like typical entrepreneurs like a mm -hmm. Grant Cardone where they're where they're very yeah. money motivated. You know what I mean? And I, I respect Grant and everything. And I, I mean, he's great for sales, but I'll just say that you know, that hustle culture thing isn't really my vibe. I'm all about ambition and making money and creating impact, but it was that hustle culture, like doing something you really love. And I saw these people doing stuff with, with unique and weird niches. And I thought of the phrase nerdpreneur. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, that's cool. Actually, you know what I thought of first was I thought of entrepreneur, which many people have oh, talked to yeah. me about before. Yeah. yeah. That's also a good one, but I couldn't get the, the, I couldn't get the, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the real estate for that. Right. Yeah, like yeah. I couldn't get the, the online stuff and somebody else already had it. They weren't doing anything with it, but, um, here's what we, what I did find was nerdpreneur. And I found my co-host who I was playing Dungeons and Dragons with. And I thought this guy, he kind of has that ambition, you know, and, and the way I describe it is you got to look for your spirit warrior, somebody who can kind of gets you in terms of, you know, where you're going, your passion level, what you're excited about. And this guy, Frank, my co-host, he kind of had all those things, but he's also different than me. You know, like he, he has different skill sets, a different perspective on a lot of things. And I love that because I didn't want to be, you know, doing the co-host thing with someone who has exactly the same, um, you know, perspective as I do. Yeah. And so we wound up talking and, and doing a couple of these interviews, just honestly, with a couple of friends of ours who we known were starting in this path. And uh, it wound up being some really cool interviews. Like you'll hear the first episode was with, is with a board game designer. And it was really kind of rough. Like I drew up a bunch of questions and I said, you know, maybe we'll just start with these questions that we ask with people. And it really led to some cool and interesting topics and conversations with this guy who was a board game designer. And all of a sudden we were like, man, maybe this could be something. And everyone I talked to about it, it's like, yeah, it's called Nerdpreneur. Uh, and people, it's like, I like that name. And I think it's a little more fun than Entrepreneur, you know, like it kind of yeah. just feels like, because you know what, we put, we, we put being nerdy first. You're following your nerdy passion first, and then you're bringing a business out of it. So Nerdpreneur made more sense than that. And, and, and you got the .com, which is amazing. It's, uh, yeah, we got that. We got NerdpreneurPodcast.com or um, at NerdpreneurPod on Twitter or Instagram or something like that. So it was, uh, it was, it all kind of fell into place. And what was funny is I, because I had a bit of a following on Instagram, uh, my, my, my Instagram is Professor Epic Productions. That's where I put like my music stuff and sort of my own D and D content out. But I, I had about you know eight thousand people or so roughly uh, who were following me. Uh, I could reach out to these people who sometimes had like ten thousand or fifteen thousand or sometimes fifty or sixty thousand people. And we've even had people have over a hundred thousand people on our podcast now that that actually would respond to me and I'd be like, Oh, cool. They're actually going to talk and interact with us. And that's one of the kind of keys I think to building your, your network is responding to people who message you. And, uh, I thought it would be a big sales pitch to get them on the podcast, but so many of them were like, Oh my God, you want to talk to me about my business and my passion? I'm in totally. I want to talk to you. And I, I just thought, you know, nobody else is highlighting these stories. There's so many people that have reacted positively to this negative COVID situation and they've actually figured out something they're passionate about, that they're excited about, and they found a way to make it and monetize it so that so many of them don't go back to that old job. Most of the people that we found started this were the stories of people who you know, discovered a passion and then also turned it into a business that became their full-time income. And there's just so many of those stories out there in weird and unique niches. I figured let's go and discern those strategies, figure out what's working for them, and also elevate those stories so that others are inspired to do it too. Um, and we want to inspire people because it's never been a better time in life to yeah. start your own business and pursue your passion. Yeah. And, and a lot of businesses you know, got hit then and mm -hmm. still continue to this day. You know, there's, there's still, you know, there's still a lot of struggling uh, with, with, um, with, with business. So, you know, why not? It's almost like here, you got the king keys to the key, kingdom, you know, freedom, baby, mm -hmm. go do what you really love to do. Is there it's a true. common thread to the personality um, of these nerdpreneurs, um, you know, as mm -hmm. far as, you know, is there a common thread personality wise to these business owners and businesses? You know, I think there is in that, you know, when you when you look at nerd, one of our key questions that we ask almost every guest is what is your definition of a nerd? And I think that one of the things that I've noticed is many people uh, are nerdy about many different things. So we and, and I guess the, the main thing that brings them all together is that they're driven 
by their excitement. You know, they're driven by their passion. You know, they found something that they really are in some ways kind of obsessed about, you know, and you know, whether it be uh, a Dungeons and Dragons writing or whether it be manufacturing and, and designing dice. Like we just, we have an episode coming up. Not sure when this will come out, might be out by the time this is out, but it was, a, 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 we have a guy who uh, runs what's called Aether Objects and he's a dice, he's an artistic dice maker. And so like dice is a weird nerdy thing, but for mm-hmm. him, he's driven by like, I didn't want to just make money with my dice. I, I, you know, we had a dice retailer on where they were like, restaurant owners and they turned into uh, dice retailers because they were kind of passionate about making D&D. But this guy is different than that. He actually wanted to make like really interesting artistic dice. So he's made dice out of like, I wonder if I can make it out of wood and have it be really cool. So he's made like rosewood ones. He made one. He's like, I wonder if I could, uh, you know, make it out of, uh, you know, uh, metal and this kind of metal. And so he'll, he'll do that. He actually had one that was sort of uh it was really strange, but he's like, yeah, I actually had an old, old uh, Mac laptops and he like constructed it out of pieces from old Mac lap- laptops that he like molded and cut into pieces that he perfectly placed. So, so he's selling stuff that is really handmade, high quality, but has sort of like this artistic bend to it. So going back to your original question, it's about the passion. They are driven by like on their terms, what they're excited about, and then finding a way to kind of, uh, you know, deliver that to the audience in a way that makes, you know, makes sense. And then they actually say, hey, if you want to support me, you know, come buy it or, you know, support my Patreon or something like that. They've kind of stumbled into business. None of them are really entrepreneurs for the most part is what I've, what I've noticed. Most of them have kind of started with something great, and then they notice people asking them like, oh my gosh, this is so good. Can I buy it? Or, oh my gosh, can I uh, support you in some way? Or can we do more with this? And they would actually do that. And people loved it. They they, they wound up being like, man, maybe this could be could be uh, a, a business. And, and nerdpreneurs tend to go through a very similar process is what I've noticed is they start with just like that passion. And they start, and the thing about passion is when you're when you're doing something a lot, you get good at it. So they take that passion and it leads to kind of their skill. And then when they get that skill, all of a sudden they get attention for that skill. And from that attention, often they get what I what I call their first sale. That's a milestone. Yeah. When somebody's willing to pay you money for something. So it comes out of being good, having skill, but the first time someone comes around and be like, okay, I'm going to pay you money for this. That's a huge milestone for them. And all of our nerdpreneurs have gone through that step where they get an, a, a, a first sale and all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, proof of concept. And in the marketing business, we kind of call that a funnel. It's like, okay, now I know how, I, how did I got this person to say yes to a product, whatever that is. Now it's about figuring out how to scale that and make that at a much higher rate or a much more um, consistent rate so that they can be able to get more people. And that's really a huge, huge deal for a lot of these nerdpreneurs is figuring out the ins and outs of how do you scale this to the point where I can, you know, have a hundred clients in a month, or I could have a thousand clients in a month, you know, depending on what it is that they're actually doing. And most of them go through kind of a critical mass point where people are really supporting them and they actually can support themselves on this nerdy passion. Um, But none of them have been really big entrepreneurs going in with like, you know, business degrees and all this other stuff. There's a couple, but very few of the nerdpreneurs we've interviewed have had that background. Most of them have just been driven by passion and kind of stumbled into success and figured it out as they go. Yeah. No incubators and no. Yeah, uh, (laughs) exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Is there somebody that else that's made a a big impact on you the most? And and what were they doing that grabbed your attention? You just shared a really good example. Would that be uh, one of the uh, entrepreneurs or nerdpreneurs that's made a big impact on you? Or is there somebody else that you went, wow, that that that's that got you? Like you just. Mm-hmm. Okay. There, there is, there is one. Um, and I, and I often tell people if they're going to start the podcast, usually start with this episode because I think it's one of our best episodes uh, that we did. Uh, it's with a guy whose name is Monkey DM. Um, now that's not his real name. His real name is Evan. Uh, but he's actually somebody that is branded himself Monkey DM, and he is his story is really interesting. And I think uh, when I was designing the the idea of okay, what is a nerdpreneur? 
and who would that be that we want on the podcast? His profile and who he was, was really the, the main driver of like that. He was kind of the epitome for me of like what that representative, what that represented. And so, yeah. So what he did, what he, his story is funny because what happened for him was he, he started actually, he's in Romania. Let's start off with that. So he's okay. in Romania and uh, in Romania, you know, he was taking uh, school to be a doctor and he actually did all of his, uh, his medical doctor degree and everything. And then the next step after that is to go and be a, uh, a, a residency doctor, right? So you have to actually apply. Now he's, uh, I believe French by nature, he learned German so he could apply to various, you know, places in Germany. And yeah. so he actually, he didn't want to be a doctor in Romania, even though he got his degree there. Cause the money for Romanian doctors is only about like 800, 900 American a month, roughly, or something oh. like that. It's, it's pretty low for a doctor to make yeah. there. So he was residency trying to do that in different places, but he had bad timing. You know, he apply. He was applying the same year that COVID hit, so no one was doing anything with new doctors. And maybe he even admits this: like maybe I wasn't good enough to get in there. But also, like it sounds like nobody was getting hired, and nobody knew what was going on. So it was just like shut all that down. We're not letting anyone new in. And to be in that situation in Romania, where he was done with school, he didn't have any real uh, job prospects. He couldn't pursue what he wanted to do, which was all his life to become a doctor, right? And now he was just stuck and broke and really in a dean like kind of difficult situation so he did play D. &D. he kind of liked it it wasn't like his it was just something he saw that somebody on reddit was actually making money from doing from doing content so they were making he saw some people who were kind of in his mind really big like oh my gosh they're making like a thousand dollars a month well man, if I could make $200 a month, I'd be fine in Romania. I could at least be able to eat and get by and do something, right? So he thought, maybe I'll just, I'll just try and see what happens. So he started putting, and he references the thank you economy from Gary Vaynerchuk, where yes. you give, 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 and then yeah. ask, right? Yeah. So, pow, 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 you know, exactly, right? So he was just thinking, you know what, let's do, let's do that. I'll just give a bunch of free stuff on Unearthed Arcana, which is a Reddit stream for what we call homebrew content. So he was making up kind of his own version of fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons content. And what was so cool is after about a month or sorry, three months, he, he did a launch in some sense of a compendium of all of his work and he said hey i've been giving this away for free for a while if you want to support me come do this and he wound up going from really just a couple of bucks a month in patreon um, all the way up to eight hundred dollars a month on patreon in that three months and so really saved his life in that way and what was cool is that proof of concept now he kind of creates content every month and to give you an idea where he's gone um even since then i mean we interviewed him when he was around nine thousand dollars a month that he was making wow. from from uh from his dungeons and dragons content yeah. yeah that's not nothing that's a full-time income and of course he doesn't get all of that it's there's expenses he pays sure. for art and all that sort of thing but he's able to live very comfortably in romania doing what he's doing he's since grown even further past that to now he's now over 15 almost 16,000 in patreon support uh support of course patreon takes their cut and i want to make sure everybody understands that but the real uh thing is he also has done an almost two million dollar maybe it was over two million dollar kickstarter uh that for his content and it's called Steinhardt, if you're not sure what it is and you want to look it up. But uh, it's a really awesome story. Imagine going to your parents and saying, like, Mom, Dad, I'm going to be a doctor. And then, like, you can't get a job as a doctor. How crazy is that? right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then he had to go into his passion. And it actually wound up being something that he's not only making more money than he would have as a doctor in Romania. He's way more successful. He's got a real knack for business. And he's me actually, I don't know, I can't speak for him, but it sounds like he's pretty happy. He sounds like he loves what he's doing and pursuing this, this passion. So if you check out that episode, you'll hear a lot about his story. And we go into a lot more about how that story happened and the logistics behind creating that that uh, that, uh, that business of his and building it from the ground up. I'll, I'll put the link underneath that. Uh, yeah, it's uh, episode uh, interview number 10, if anyone's wondering. Okay, What's, and now how about you? Where did you get these performing chop, chops? I mean, you rap, <laughs> you produce content, you host podcasts, you sold knife sets. Yes. <laughs> Fashions and talents all come together at Crest. Well, you know, I, I, was, uh, I, was, I was raised, I think, to... Uh, 
you know, my, my dad is somebody who's always had sort of high standards in uh, my life. And so, you know, I went to school and when you go to school, I just was expected to get gr great grades. That was one area, but I wasn't also, I, but I was also expected to not just do well in school. Like I couldn't spend all my time studying. I remember when I was a kid, I would read a lot, which is always like, sometimes you want your kids reading a lot, but sure. I remember my dad would get, you know, mad at me for just sitting around reading all day. He's like, no, you have to go out and like, you have to play sports. You have to go out and, and be artistic. You have to, you know, do stuff that's, that's different. Go use your creativity. And like, they would just kick me out of the house sometimes and be like, go, you have to go outside to go do something. And so I think because of that push from my parents on both sides to be uh, a go-getter and to, to be balanced in that way they were really they 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 were really great that way i was very lucky i think because my parents were were they rarely said no to anything i wanted to try you know like they they like they said hey play piano when you're a kid now i never really got good at piano and i played it for a while i got to like grade two but they never said no they put me in piano because it was a good thing to do and uh, i think that helped you know i think also when i got into high school i got into theater and there was something about being on stage and speaking lines and and being able to to do that and the attention that i got at that moment was really really great for me and so there was uh there was this this thing in mind that that created a spark and then i thought to myself if i'm going to go to university i didn't want to go to university to get a job my, my i had many teachers and people who were uh you know around my school saying you know take what you want to do in school pursue your passion and i think that was just the message i heard from a lot of different places and so when i went to university um, I could have done a lot of things like a business or whatever, but I actually decided after my first year in university to apply to go to the theater program there. Wow. And so I went to theater school at University of Toronto. I got in. It was a you know great place to be, uh, I think, practically trained in skill sets like performing and, you know, getting up on stage. And there's a lot of things that I use still to this day that came out of that that theater degree. You know, a lot of people, I think, what that, at least a lot of my friends went to school for, say, business or science and engineering. And it's not that it, I had a bit of an aptitude. I probably would not have done well as an engineer. I'm not going to lie. I don't want to pretend like I was an amazing science student. I wasn't. Um, I did theater. I did a lot of like, you know, art stuff in school. But but I think that the skill sets that I got out of it are things that I still use to this day. You know, when I get up on stage or have to do a talk or I have to connect with people, you know, the ability to manage my emotions under, say, stressful or pressure situations, a lot of that came out of my training in theater and the ability to just kind of like fail as well. Um, I got over a lot of the the fear of failure, fear of looking kind of stupid. And I realized that in order to be good at something, you have to surrender to being bad at it, bad at it for a little while. You know, it, you have to be willing to be bad at something in order to get good. And I learned that through theater. Like there was a lot of things you you would try when you're doing a monologue or doing a scene that just doesn't work. And so by failing over and over, you eventually find the things that really resonate and work in a show. Sure. And now you're, and then by the end, you're getting this finished product that you show to show to the world. So that's always kind of how I, how I've, I've, uh, I've operated, I guess, is, you know, I prepare, I work through things and I, I'm willing to fail. And then I get out to uh, the world with, uh, with something a lot more confident, a lot more prepared and, uh, and a lot more ready for people to appreciate. And I think that's really important too, in a business context, especially mm. if you're a nerdpreneur, but you know, you've got to be willing to fail. And in our society, we're not trained to fail. And, you know, it, it floors people and they don't yeah. get back off the mat ever again. And and it's like, no, learn from your failures and, and study it and, and, you know, try again and keep trying until you get it. And, you know, it, it's like, you know, probably you're, when you made calls selling the, the, the when I was selling stuff. knives. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, yeah. I could do a whole bit on like, I didn't even get to the point of where I was like selling knives. I've had so many great coaches and people who helped me through that company, uh, you know, selling Cutco knives. They were, they were honestly a huge, huge impact and not an easy job. I don't want to make it seem like it was easy. No, in fact, it was doors slammed in your face. Well, it was, it was actually a very, very difficult job for somebody to, to do because, you know, you're, I was mostly commissioned. There is a base pay, but if you were on base pay, you weren't making a lot. And so it was mostly about getting results and very much, it's very common for people to attach their results to their ego. 
And so when you're in sales, and especially if you get off to a great start, if you sell a lot and people recognize you for it and you start to believe, man, I'm really good at this. I'm really awesome at this. And then um, you don't realize that that initial first few appointments might have just been kind of beginner's luck or because you were seeing, say, friends and family and people who were nicer, you're doing practice appointments. And then, you know, it, it, I remember when I got my first no sale because I had gone like sale, 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 like seven in a row. When I got my first no sale, I remember, you know, my uh, the the client being like, is this your first no sale? Like it was kind of shocking to me that someone didn't buy. I thought everybody was going to just buy, but that was such an important experience to go through because you start to realize like, okay, you know, being uh, no sales are a part of your success. You know, mm -hmm. I always say like failure and success are part are on the same coin. Okay. Yeah. And so you have to have both, you know, if I look back on my on my, my actual, say, first 10 days or my first summer where I did sell a lot of knives. I sold almost $18,000 in three months or something like that, um, which is very, very solid for at least yeah. the time period when I was doing it. You would have put Hal Elrod to shame. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Hal Elrod was like one of the best out there. But I also learned a lot from him, actually, because I met him a number of times because uh, he would speak at these conferences. Yeah. Uh, you know, shout out to The Miracle Morning. It was It's a great book. Yeah. Um, but, but I'll say this, that that, you know, I, I look back on that and I'd have to add up, I did this many appointments, you know, it might've been, uh, you know, 30 appointments in my first 10 days, or it might've been, you know, a hundred appointments in my first month, whatever it was. But if I did a hundred appointments in my first month, I probably had 40 no sales. Okay. And that was part of my success. So the way I would look at it is, you know, I got more failures than most people even did demos you know there are people that i worked with that they would only do you know 10 appointments in a week and if they only did 10 appointments in a week they might have got you know six or seven or even eight sales if they were all really good at it but you know they, they only got two no sales but they actually went up selling less than me than if i did 20 appointments right or even 30 appointments because yeah i would actually get 10 no sales whereas they did just 10 appointments and i would have way more sales because failure was part of their success so i always said yeah i succeeded more but I also failed more than most people. And so being willing to fail more, being willing to do that gives you the option of having bigger and bigger success. Yeah, no kidding. And and also it stretches you because, you, you know, after you probably your 10th no sale, you're <laughs> kind of feeling a bit like, huh, I don't like this. Yeah. Right. So it stretches you to be creative, try new things, maybe try new attempts or um ways well, to connect with people or well, even being willing to help uh, uh, yeah and and sorry go ahead be willing well, be, being willing to get help that was a big part yeah. of it right like when, when i started to actually like i remember when i was uh you know uh moving when i basically my first summer, I did pretty well. I was in the flow of it. Then I went back to school. My second summer, I came back as an assistant manager. And as an assistant manager, I was expected to sell a lot, right? And expected to lead the team and also to teach people who were under, uh, who were new, just getting started, how I was getting success. Now, I hadn't really sold knives in like eight months. And so you're a little bit rusty, right? So I remember going out and I got like one sale for a set in my first like couple of demos. And I'm like, all right, sweet, great. I'm doing, doing that. That great. And then I went on a string of, I want to say 13 or 14, no sales in a row. It was, it was very like, boom, 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 boom. Like, man, am I, am I still good at this? And you start to have those conversations. Like, can I really do this? Is this going to work out? Am I, am I, you know, in a position that I can't, I can't do anymore. Have I lost that, that sales mojo or whatever it was. And I remember at that moment, I was, I was like, okay, I, I have a choice here. I can either quit, right. Try to find something else or I can kind of dig in on what I'm doing and get some help. And my, my and I said, you know what, I'm going to go out and try to get some help. So I went to my managers. I went to the people who I was, uh, you know, on the team with, I started listening to closing talks online. And I'll tell you, like, just by listening to that stuff over and over and over again, on my way to and from my appointments, the, 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 I don't know if it's just the resonance. I think part of it is like, if you fill your brain with good things and you fill your brain with things that will help you, it actually does give you a, a different level of energy. When you go in a different level of expectation, a different level of confidence, even if you haven't had the result yet, 
by putting good stuff into your brain, it moves the needle. And I remember when I, I was asked to field train the president of the company because he happened to live in the city. Like I remember it was kind of a big deal because the president of, of the company was like, we I want him to go on some demos. Who's the assistant manager in my area? And I was the guy who was coming off 13 no sales in a row, having not really had a lot of a lot of uh, success. He, uh, you know, he saw me go through a demo. It was a no sale, but then he wound up taking me to, uh, uh, for a coffee and we had a conversation and he gave me a couple of like just nuanced tips. And also it was just like, you know, Hey, uh, you're really good at this. It's actually really, he gave me a little encouragement. Right. And I'll tell you that next demo, I sold almost a thousand dollars. It was, it was like a total flip in terms of my mentality. So don't being willing to, you know, push through those points where it's dif discomfort and hard and ask for help to keep moving. Cause if what you're doing is not working, like keep finding answers, keep looking for them. There are answers to be found. And uh, I remember that my whole life, just, you know, if something's not going well, be willing to ask for help and go to the people who know how to get that success. You're going to, you're going to find it. All right. I'm going to run out of racetrack on our 26. <laughs> I know I'll talk for a while. If you give no, me a chance. Oh, it's great. Um, and we're with uh, Chris Saunders and we're talking about entrepreneurs. We're also talking about the entrepreneurial journey too, a little bit. And mm. so, um, Real quick, before we wrap this part up, because we're going to go to the deeper dive, I have a few more questions for you. Uh, sure. where, where do we reach you to learn more about your work with uh, Nerdpreneurs? If you'd like to uh, listen to us, you'll find us uh, at Nerdpreneur. Uh, really, at, if you want to find us anywhere, Nerdpreneur is the uh, is the the phrase. So we're on YouTube, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, uh, all of your podcast apps uh, from Apple Podcasts to Spotify to uh, Stitcher. You're going to put in Nerdpreneur. You can find us. There's nobody else out there that's doing what we're doing. So I always tell people, if you like what we're doing, you can support us on Patreon forward slash Nerdpreneur, and you'd be supporting the one and only nerdy business podcast in the world right now. And we would love that because, uh, because yeah, there's not enough people out there that uh, that know about all the nerdpreneur people. Yeah, I love it. And Spotify hasn't cut you, but they did let go of uh, Megan and Harry. So uh, oh, you've funny. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, this is great. Stay with us for those watching. Don't you know you want more? You just click below, and we'll have our deeper dive next. <laughs>